I've always been a big fan of time-lapse photography, and I've had quite a few requests over the years to make a tutorial about how to create them in Blender. Time-lapses are a really great way to show off all your hard work once you've finished modeling an environment. So in this video, we're going to be covering a lot of really cool techniques that you can use to turn pretty much any digital environment into a time-lapse. We'll go over the animated sky, the rain effects, atmosphere, and a whole bunch of other really useful stuff. This video has been sponsored by Nvidia and Scan. If you watch this channel for a while, you'll know that Nvidia and Scan have been supporting Decoded for a long time now to promote the RTX Studio program. If you've never heard of that before, it's an initiative by Nvidia to work with their partners to develop the best hardware and software solutions for creative work. Because let's be honest, there's no point having a really powerful GPU if you haven't got the software to back it up. That's why they've developed tools like the Optics API, which delivers much faster render speeds from the exact same hardware. Scan is one of the top vendors of computer hardware in Europe, and I've personally used them for well over a decade. There's a link in the description where you can find out much more about the RTX Studio program devices sold by Scan. But for now, let's crack on with the rest of the tutorial. So building the actual environment was pretty simple, honestly. I just used a free tool called FSpy, which I've covered a bunch of times in different videos. You can just use that to match the perspective of a real photograph. Then I just started modeling things out from there. I found this really beautiful Japanese inspired house by a company called Stuart Silk Architects. Now, one of the problems you'll sometimes run into when you're trying to match a photograph is that you can't really gauge the dimensions of the building. You think that everything's going really well, then you move out of camera view and you realize the perspective is just completely wrong. So I did start to worry that this building was a little bit of a weird shape and it didn't look quite right. I wanted to find an aerial view of the building so I could just double check that the building actually looked like my building looked. Now, obviously architects don't publish the address of private houses online, but I wasn't gonna let that stop me. You see, I like to play this admittedly quite nerdy game called GeoGuessr, where you have to try and find your position using Google Street View. For instance, in the game mode that I'm playing here, you have to guess which country you're in and get as many right in a row as possible. So I knew this house was somewhere in Washington state and had a few photographs like this where you can kind of see what the coastline looks like. So I used all of my geo-guessing skills and I actually managed to find it on Google Earth. In fact, not only did I manage to find the house, but when I lined it up with the building that I made, it matched almost exactly, which was a total nice surprise. I didn't expect that at all. Sorry, that was a bit of a tangent. Let's get back to the tutorial. So to make a time-lapse sky dome, it's actually quite easy. I usually just start out with the star field for the night sky. So in the shader editor, make sure that you change the workspace to world mode. If you plug in a noise texture into a color ramp and you set the mode to constant, it'll give you loads of nice little dots like a really starry night. You can play around with the different values on the color ramp and on the noise texture and you get all sorts of different effects. I like to make the black value just slightly above pure black so you don't have a, like a completely black night sky because that looks a little bit naff. You can plug a texture coordinate node into the noise texture node and if you animate the Z rotation, it'll make the stars look like they're spinning in the night sky. Now you can do this just by animating it with a few keyframes, but I always think it's easier just to add a quick driver. If you type hash frame into any value in Blender, it will automatically keep increasing that number for every frame. You can also slow down the effect if that's too fast by putting a forward slash and then whichever number you want to divide it by, for instance, 2000. So that's the night sky sorted. For the actual day sky effect, you just want to add in a sky texture node and set it to Nishita if it doesn't automatically. You can press I on the various different values to keyframe them and you can make the uh, sky sort of rotate around and move up in its elevation over the day to make it look like it's changing its position. That'll make the sun rise and set. And then all you have to do is you need to add a mix node and mix between the day and the night so that obviously over time, it goes from nighttime to daytime. Finally, you can add a few clouds to the sky just by mixing the sky texture with an emission shader. And you can use a new noise node as the factor. You're probably gonna have to plug that through a map range or color ramp node and just crunch the values. Just like the stars, you can also make the clouds move across the sky over time by animating the Z rotation. 
Now for the plants and the grass, you can just make those yourself. There's plenty of tutorials online, but honestly, I would recommend that you just use a third party library. There's some free ones online and there's some really good ones that aren't. Especially if you're working on a scene like this where it's a garden and obviously there's lots of plants, you're going to sell out for a lot of time just by using pre-modeled assets. Personally, I use this add-on called Botanic. You can just select the ground and add any type of grass that you want. It'll automatically spawn the assets with loads of different variation. You can even use the slider to change the seasons so you can like make the grass go dry or whatever. So I just went into weight painting mode and I manually painted in the density for the grass to stop it appearing like through the flagstones and through the rocks and things like that. So when I started working on the plants I made sure to turn on the optics denoiser in the viewport. Grass assets especially are just inherently noisy. They're small and they're closely packed together. They usually have quite low roughness. They often have a transparent element. Usually they'll have some sort of translucency or subsurface scattering and all that stuff creates noise. That makes it really difficult when you're trying to tweak the textures and get the right look for the grass because you've just got so much noise in the viewport. So it's really great these days to be able to do this stuff basically in real time because the optics viewport denoiser is the fastest denoiser in Blender. Okay, so next let's talk about the lights. Now most of the lights in this scene were either area lights or point lights. I did also use a few emissive textures just for those little steak lamps that are in the grass. To get a more realistic look, I enabled nodes for all the lights and I added a black body node to each one of the colours. That just gives you a more accurate light profile because it matches real world physics and the sort of colour temperatures that lights actually produce. It certainly looks a lot better than just trying to guess the colour of the light by yourself, which usually looks pretty bad. So to make the lights turn on and off at different times, all I had to do was obviously just scrub to the right part of the timeline and set a keyframe on the light strength to be either be, you know, 10 or whatever if I wanted it to be on. Then I would go to the next frame and set it to zero when it should be off. You can add an extra touch of realism and a bit more interest to the scene by making the lights turn on and off at different times especially the lights that are outside. They're usually solar powered and quite often they'll have some sort of light sensor that'll tell them when they should be turning on and off, depending on how much light they're receiving. So if there's uh, one of those lights that are in the shadow before the other lights, that might turn off faster. Okay, so now let's add some weather effects. Those rocks that are in the water were created using a displacement map and micro displacement. Now, I used to avoid micro displacement in the shader like the plague because it used to be really slow. But these days it's supported by optics and it works lovely and fast unless you go really crazy with it and you've got like thousands of rocks or something. Now, most of the surfaces, when they get wet, they look darker and they become more shiny. If it doesn't absorb water, it probably won't get darker. For instance, plastic, but something like rock definitely will. So all I had to do was for each material, I just had to add a hue saturation node to the texture and I would put a keyframe on the value and I would move the value down whenever it should be wet. Then I would add another keyframe onto the material for the roughness and I would make it so it gets more shiny as it gets wet too. Making the actual rain itself was really easy. I just added a huge plane above the sky and I gave it a particle system. The particle object was just a really small sphere with a glass material to make it look like raindrops. You're going to want to go into the particle settings and make sure that you uncheck show emitter, otherwise that huge plane in the sky is going to show up in the render. If you've got a large open body of water like this pond and you want it to be affected by the rain, you can do that really easily using dynamic paint, which is a system in Blender where you can affect the surface of one object based on its proximity to another object. So the first thing you want to do is select your rain emitter and you want to add the dynamic paint effect and set it to brush. Go into the settings and make sure that the particle system is selected as the brush source. Then on your water surface, you want to go into edit mode and add a ton of subdivisions because you need to have some actual geometry on the plane that can get deformed. Add the dynamic paint effect to the water surface too, but this time set it to a canvas and change the type to waves. From here, it's just a case of playing around with all the different settings to get a, some sort of appearance that looks good to you based on how fast your time lapse is going and things like that. You're going to want to make sure you bake this out as well. And that's quite important 
Blender doesn't like it when you don't bake out a simulation like a particle system before you try and render. Usually it'll end up coming out wrong. If you are planning to put rain into your time lapse, make sure you turn on motion blur too. Now I found out this the hard way and I had to re-render all of the frames with rain in them. Obviously you can't see individual raindrops clearly on a photograph of rain anyway and it looks especially stupid on a time lapse where everything's moving really fast. Now traditionally motion blur used to be quite computationally expensive but on the newer 30 series RTX cards it's actually GPU accelerated now which means that Blender will use the power of your GPU to calculate the motion blur which is much faster. One last piece of advice for rain if you're doing it with a particle system, do yourself a favour, add a massive plane right underneath the scene and scale it up, then give it a collision property and enable kill particles. That'll just remove the particles from the scene once they've left the camera's view. It'll make your viewport performance much faster. Okay now let's add all the little finishing touches that take this to the next level. So the huge plane outside that makes the sea just has a noise texture on it and a normal map to make some waves. Those weren't really visible in the final render, but just like the clouds and the stars, I just used a driver to change the noise pattern's location over time, which makes a reasonably convincing wave pattern from a distance. You might have noticed that all the plants have a little bit of movement to them. That actually just comes straight out of the Botanic add-on. It has all these pre-made animations for various levels of wind. Now unfortunately, you can't keyframe the strength of the wind as far as I know, so you're basically stuck with the same level of wind through the whole animation, which is a shame because I would have liked to have like a pretty violent storm or something in there in the middle. But still, it is a nice way that you can add a little bit of movement into what's basically otherwise just a static scene. Another way that I found to add a little bit of life and movement to things was just to give the camera a little bit of a shake during the rainstorm, like the wind was moving the camera or something. Now I like to use the Shakeify add-on for this. It's free and it was developed by Ian Huber and Nathan Vegdal. I use this add-on pretty much every time I make something in Blender these days. I think it's great. You just have to select the type of camera shake that you want from a drop down list and then you can even keyframe the strength of it so that it'll only turn on at a certain point in the animation. Now the final step before rendering this out was just to add some volumetric haze. I just added a really big cube and I removed the principal shader and then I added a principal volume with low density. I animated the density so that the fog would only appear on the morning and when it was raining. Volumetrics used to be really noisy and it was always a horrible thing to have enabled in the viewport, but the RTX series of GPUs can access something called Nano VDB, which has been developed by Nvidia, and you can use it in Blender to basically GPU accelerate volumetric effects to make them much faster. Now, of course, it wouldn't be a decoded video if there wasn't a problem that I had to fix at the end. So while I was recording part of this video, I accidentally turned off the stars that come on at night. So the night sky was just pitch black. Now to fix that, all I had to do was just delete all of the glass in the building. Then I added every other object to a new collection and I made that collection a holdout, which basically means those objects don't get rendered. Then I just rendered everything out and that basically gave me just the night sky and everything else was masked out as black. Then all I had to do was just recomposite that back on top of my original footage and I got all the stars back. So this is a video that I've been wanting to make for a long time, but I've never been able to fit it in. I actually planned to start making this originally in last March, and I mean March 2021. So a big thank you to NVIDIA and SCAN for sponsoring this content and finally making it possible. I really hope you enjoyed this one. Make sure you hit the subscribe button if you haven't already, because there's tons of cool stuff coming out in the next few weeks. In the description, you'll find links to everything that I've discussed today. Make sure you check out the link to Scan and their awesome range of NVIDIA Studio devices, including their award-winning 3XS range of systems.